As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. I always wanted to be a gangster. I know why you're afraid to go out at night. Go out at night. Meanwhile, Wendy began to understand it was time for her, John, and Michael to fly home from Neverland. To understand... Promote him. Do what he already does. He already does. You're under arrest, Major Sharp. You're under arrest, Major Sharp. What? Stand back. In our previous video, we talked about how weak forms are key to understanding native speech, just like this. No one's saying that songs shouldn't be copyrighted, but you just can't copyright a chord sequence. You just can't. This is my like livelihood, and this is the thing that I've worked my entire life to do, and have to have someone like just say that you've stolen it. I really felt like I had to take a stand, and either way you lose, because you, you spend God knows what to win the case, and then you don't get that back, and if you lose the case, you lose. Today, we're going to look at how weak forms are joined together with strong words and often create whole new sounds. Like in this example from Nick Cannon. Let's get to it if we gotta get to it. Did you hear the w sound between two and it? Let's get to it. To it. To it. To it. If we gotta get to it. To it. To it. To it. Let's get to it if we gotta get to it. In our previous video, we also showed some of the rules of weak forms and when you should use them. If you haven't seen that video yet, the link is in the description. But here's a quick recap. English has two categories of words. Content words, which are the most important because they carry the meaning of the sentence. And grammar words, which connect the content words together. You might be surprised to hear this, but weak forms actually help native speakers to understand each other better. What? Stand back. That might sound strange, because if you're an English language learner, you might be wondering why you find it so much harder to understand native speakers than you do other non-native speakers. To understand why weak forms play such an important role in English, we'll need to take a little journey through some of the ways we use them. Okay, which of these two can you understand more of? As you can see, the content words alone are nearly enough to fully understand the meaning. Whereas the grammar words carry no meaning at all. Because the grammar words aren't important, we often weaken them with a special sound called the schwa, which sounds like this. But, 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 but you just, just, just can't copyright a, a, a chord sequence. You just, you just, you just can't. So why do native speakers do this? And why is it so important? Well, if the meaning in the sentence is carried by the content words, but you stress the grammar words, you're actually distracting native speakers from the message you're trying to communicate. Take this non-native speaker, for example. Throw them into a pan filled with water. Turn on the heat to high. So in that example, it sounds like the speaker is using the adverb too. What he means to say, of course, is Turn the heat up to high, not too high. This is just like how of course is not the same as of course. Even though on and off are grammar words, they don't actually have weak forms. That's how we can know that taking care of your sister is not the same as taking care of your sister. Or when I tell you that the keys on the table are mine, I'm not claiming ownership of the keys on the table. The keys on the table are mine. The keys on the table are mine. So, we've talked about how and when to make words weak. But what we haven't talked about yet is how weak forms are not actually independent words. They have to be attached to a strong word. And the strong word typically comes after the weak word. That's why words that start with the prefix to, or... Is that man in this courtroom today? 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 are pronounced in the same way as the grammar word to. To have someone like to have to have. We say to go and to get, which are pronounced the same as the prefix in the word together. So let's get into some exceptions to the rule now. Tommy took to it pretty well too. Maybe, if I'm up to it. 
There's only one way to eat a brace of conies. Let's get something to eat. The doctor said to allow 15 minutes. I'm going to allow that. <clears throat> We're trying very hard. To understand why it is that you insist on defying us. To overcome something, you have to understand what a perfect engine it is. If you notice carefully, you'll hear that the word to is not pronounced with its weak form in those sentences. It's pronounced in its strong form, to. But why? That's because in all those examples, it comes before a vowel sound, and this is a common feature of English pronunciation. To it. To eat. To allow. To understand. The reason this happens is actually quite interesting. It happens because we would actually make our content word harder to understand, which is the opposite of what we want. To allow. You can hear the content word allow. To allow if I say it fast. To allow. Tlau. 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 Never realized how hard it is to pronounce T then L before. Tlau. So, we use the strong form so that these words don't mix together and cause difficulty for the listener. But why the extra w sound? The w appears because English hates what we call hiatus, which means a pause or a gap. In this case, between the two vowel sounds in to and eat. There are two very common ways to resolve this in English. The first is as we have just demonstrated. We glide from the first sound to the next. And as we do this, a w sound appears between the two vowels. When your mouth comes forward to pronounce the u sound, it has to come back to pronounce the e sound. Watch me. Ooh-wee. Ooh-wee. The first reason is as we've just demonstrated. We glide from the first sound to the next. And as we move from the first vowel position, u, to the second vowel position, e, we naturally meet this w sound. This happens because when we say u, our lips move forward, and when we say e, they move backwards. And in order for this to happen, the w sound appears between the two movements. Ooh-ee. To eat. The second way this can be resolved is by using what is called a glottal stop. We produce this glottal stop by stopping the sound in our throat as we are saying it. A good example of this is with the phrase, uh-oh. That little gap in between the two words is the glottal stop. Americans tend to use the glottal stop after the vowel at the end of one word and before the vowel at the start of the next word. Like this. Don't you have enough to eat, sweetheart? You know, there are other things to eat in Japan besides sushi. And Brits tend to resolve this with the strong form and the glide. In this case, the whoop sound. Try to eat a piece of fresh fruit every now and then. They're just a good thing to eat at a picnic. To eat. To eat. To eat. To eat. To eat. To eat. That said, there are plenty of Americans who resolve this with the glide. And there are plenty of Brits that use the glottal stop. You can do it whichever way you like, but it's a good idea to learn to recognize the two variations to help you improve your listening. If you're a native speaker or not, please let us know in the comments which one you tend to use and let us know where you're from as well. Okay, take a look at this example here. I went to America to see the Statue of Liberty. To America. To America. To America. To America. To see. To see. To see. To see. In these examples, the speakers all use the glide with w between to and America. To America. But they all use the weak form in to see. To see. You'll also notice that there is another glide in this sentence. But this time, it goes from the content word statue into the grammar word of. I cut the head off the Statue of Liberty and send it back to France. Statue of Liberty. Instead of the grammar word joining the start of a content word, statue ends with that same oo vowel sound and the weak form of 
begins with a vowel sound. So it sounds like Statue of Liberty. Glide sounds between two content words also happen a lot in English, but that is content for a bigger video, which we'll likely make in the near future. So let us know in the comments if that would interest you. We've just got a couple more things to talk about on this topic, but before we do that, could you please quickly just drop a like and a subscribe to show your support for the channel. It really helps us enormously. We've talked about the W sound, but that's not the only sound that can appear between a grammar word and a content word that begins with a vowel sound. So let's look at the other two now. Come on in. Do what he already does. He already does. You're under arrest, Major Sharp. You're under arrest, Major Sharp. So, can you identify the glide sound in these two sentences? I often go shopping on Tuesdays. Your auntie makes the best mooncake. In the first example, the glide sound is yup. I often. I often go shopping on Tuesdays. In the second one, it's a r sound. Your auntie makes the best mooncake. Your auntie. You'll notice the second example is just like the American r sound. So accents that already have this feature don't need to change anything. On the other hand, accents such as Standard Southern or RP British, they can't say your auntie. They would say your auntie. If you enjoyed this video, we think you'll really enjoy this introduction to Wheat Forms video that you can watch here. Don't forget, a like and a subscribe really helps our channel. See you next time.